are continuing in the book of John. Gospel according to John, the good news according to John. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the book of John. We're able to read, and Lord, it brings us to a confrontation with Christ where we need to determine uh, whether we believe in him or we do not. So, Father, I thank you so much that this is such a, a valuable book to use in talking to others about Christ. It presents a case for Christ that is very solid. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity to read your, your word. I pray that you would give us wisdom as we learn to take your word and apply it to our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Today's objectives. What are we going to cover today? John 1, 9 through 18. Which, again, we always look at the outline to kind of see where we're at in the book. But we will be talking about Jesus is the Word who became flesh to reveal the Father. And so there is no better representation of who the Father is than when Jesus came in human form, when He took on flesh. So we will be talking about how Jesus came to reveal the Father. Let's read the passage, John 1, 9 through 18. It says, That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received all grace for grace, or and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So that is our portion of Scripture for today, and we're going to kind of peel back some of these things. And throughout this book, it's going to be very common to define words, what they really mean, and it helps us to understand what's being said. So, John 1, 9, commonly known as the Quaker's Text. Common among the teaching of the Quakers is that uh, when we read in verse 9 where it says that was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. The Quakers believe that every man was born with something inside of them that made them aware of God. That every person born into the world has a light inside of them. Um, so there's two views on this text. There's kind of the Quaker view, and then there's the, we can just call it the non-Quaker view. Uh, but it's that Jesus gives light to every person born into the world. That is the Quaker view. Or the second one is that Jesus is the light that illuminates unto salvation or judgment. Meaning that when we are born, we eventually get to the point where we are illuminated to the fact that we are either going to believe in Christ or we're not. So we're, we're brought to a decision of either righteous decision or we will face judgment. So that's kind of the two different versions of this one verse. Um, the Quakers uh, took their belief kind of a few steps further, but that is the gist of what they, what they believe. So... So option one, John 1, 9 through 10. The world did not know him. What does the word know? It's the Greek word egno, which means I am taking in knowledge, coming to know, or I come to know, learn, I ascertain, or realize. 
So when the world did not know Christ, they did not come to realize who He was. In the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, there's a verse, I think in chapter 2, where it talks about the Pharisees, and it says if they had known who Jesus really was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They did not come to believe in Him on who He really was, who He really came as, and that was the Son of God to reveal the Father, the Chosen One. So taking that into account, they did not come to ascertain or realize who He really was. So the world did not know Him. They didn't accept Him as the Son of God. He was just another man. He was a guy that they eventually thought was dangerous, so they crucified Him. So when we read those verses, um, it gives this idea that they did not know or come to understand it. So in this option one, giving light to every man that comes into the world, starting in verse 18, John chapter 3, it says, He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So think about that for a second. This is making the case for the Quaker view. So option one, this, these verses are saying men chose darkness over the light, meaning they had light. They had the option of believing in that light, but they chose not, so they are condemned. Verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds could be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John was also baptizing in Anon, near Salem because there was such water there and they came uh, where uh, and they came and were baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So the earlier verses they're basically talking about people in the world are condemned already because they are refusing the light. So the Quakers use this passage of scripture to say see men love darkness rather than the light meaning the light was there but they chose against it look at Romans 1 again making the case for the Quaker view of the light is revealed to all men coming into the world Romans 1 starting in verse 18 says for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth how can lost people suppress the truth if they don't know it. They suppress the truth in unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world His invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even His eternal power and Godhead, Godhead so that they are without excuse because although they knew God they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. This sounds pretty accurate of today. There's a lot of people today that want to take the creator and worship more of the creation than the creator. But again, this kind of backs the Quaker view in that there is a light out there. It is in them. And people choose to suppress the truth or put it down. So this first option of, is there a light that is in everybody that is born into the world? The light of God is kind of in them. 
there's an awareness or something in man that gives them this inkling that God is there, but what they do is they choose to deny it, live their own life, they get distracted, they move on, they don't pursue God or seek to glorify God, they just live their own life. Romans 2, 14-16, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. So here you have this idea that there's a law written on the hearts of men, and we have a conscience. So is that the light? When, when this light that is given to every man coming into the world, is it our conscience? Is it that we have something... Uh, kind of figuratively written on our hearts so that we're aware? Is that it? Is, is the Quaker view correct in John 1.9 that this light is given to everybody? Option 2. This is the most popular view. Is option 2. John 1.9. He was the true light that enlightens every man coming into the world. Meaning, if not that you are born with the light, but God's light eventually confronts you and you make a decision on whether or not you are going to accept it or you're not going to accept it. So instead of the Quaker view, this is kind of the universal view that God's light will shine on everybody and they will either choose, choose to believe in Him or they will choose not to, um, whether of righteousness or of sin. Let's look at John 16.8. There's a lot of theologians that have a hard time wrestling with God has revealed Himself to every man that is born. Uh, there's not a lot of scripture that kind of explains that further. We see those verses and the argument that the Quakers make where there's a law written on our hearts and everything else, but it's hard to wrestle that with... Uh, verses in the Bible that talk about that men can't really understand the things of God unless they are taught, unless they are revealed to them through Scripture. So there's a little bit of controversy there on what that would mean. Uh, is that a clear understanding if you believe the Quaker view? Do you have a clear understanding that God is there and He sent His Son or, or any of that? Or So defining that light with the Quaker view poses a little bit of a problem. John 16, 8 to 11. says, And when He has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in Me. Of righteousness, because I go to My Father and you see Me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. These verses are basically talking about Christ is going to come and the world is going to be convicted either to unbelief and to stay in death, or they're going to be convicted into righteousness and they will be saved. Um, so this idea of more of a universal opportunity for Christ to be accepted is, is more of the popular view on John 1.9 when it says that the light has come to every man that comes into the world, meaning the opportunity is to everybody. It's a universal invitation to everybody like I said, if you believe that God's light or awareness or your conscience or whatever comes into the world to everybody, uh, I think there's a little bit of a problem with that that you have to reconcile. Um, in Romans that we read, it talked about creation, that you see that God is there and everything. How do you marry those two together? Uh, could it be that people are born and they kind of start thinking, you know, I think there's something bigger than myself out there. I can believe that. I can believe that people have that, you know, hey, I want to explore something or I want to look at, I want to look into the religion that's out there or creation, who made creation. I'm a scientist. I'm exploring how things were made. I'm fine with all that. Um, but I think ultimately that verse talks about that Christ is universally uh the invitation is to everybody. So, 
All right, option two. This interpretation says that God has offered his light to all men who have come into the world, thus emphasizing the universality of the offered light rather than an inner awareness or light within all men who are born. Like I said, if, if light is to every man that is born, how do you reconcile that with, you know, men are in darkness that the Bible talks about, things like that. So I think that, I think ultimately men are brought to a point in their life where they're either going to pursue God or they're not. They're going to accept the gospel invitation or they're not. All right, John 1, 10 to 11 says, He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So, verse 10, Jesus is said to be the creator. He created the world, and yet the world did not perceive him as such. Meaning that God's ways, or God's word, and everything else that was put forth, the, the world kind of suppressed that. They didn't follow God. That goes all the way back to um, all the way back to the beginning of the Old Testament. It didn't take long. One of the things that I was studying this week going over the doctrine of sin that I will be teaching next after this. Do you realize that the children of Adam and Eve, one murdered the other? And it's like from the very beginning, there's issues on following God. The very first people that were made, what they do? They disobeyed God. They had everything to their disposal. Paradise. Except for the one thing. And it was the one thing that got them, right? And then you go to their kids. And what happens? Murder happens in the Bible. Literally in the first few chapters. Isn't that amazing? Um, looking at creation... Uh, over the Creator. But anyway, the world did not perceive Him or know Him in an honorable way, understand who He truly was in a way that their life was in response to that. So, Jesus came to His own special people, His Jewish He came as a Jew. He came to Israel as one of them, and they did not perceive Him as the Christ, even though they had prophesied regarding the time and place of His coming. He came to his own, and what happened? His own were distracted, too busy, worrying about my own stuff. Is that you? Is that you and me? Are you just too busy to give God time? That's what happened when he literally showed up on scene. He shows up, and everybody's too busy about what they're, what they're doing, how they're running everything. Here you have Jesus showing up, he eventually reveals himself publicly, and what happens? People don't like it. They don't like him. Why? Because they're too busy in themselves. It's very easy to live a life where we're not seeking what God wants. We don't wake up every morning and go, where does God want me to go? What does God want me to do? We have all these things in our life that distract us from doing what God wants us to do. Is that you? Is that me? Do we wake up with that? He came to his own special people and his own people didn't receive him. Why? They had their own plans. Very sad case. John 1, 12 to 13 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So, but as many, meaning individually, the nation didn't come to Christ, but there were individuals there that did accept Him, that did understand, hey, this guy, this guy is the chosen one. He, he is who He says he, he is. He gave them authority to be children of God. What does that mean? Authority. The Greek word exousion, which means power, authority, weight, especially moral authority and influence. When you believe in Christ as your Savior, you are now given rights. You have rights to the body of Christ, to the family of God. And so that's what happens. We are given the authority as children because we now have rights. We're in the family. And when the word says receive, you can say receive and believe are together. 
they're synonymous terms. You receive by believing. So Jesus comes on scene. He starts talking to people about who He is. This is who I am. I've come to reveal the Father. I am the one that was prophesied so long ago. I am here. I'm here to be your Savior. I'm here to be your King. Everything's good. I'm going to make everything new and great. Nah. Not interested. You're putting a kink in my chain. I have plans here. There's things that I'm doing. I don't. So what did they do? They chose not to believe in Him. Not to believe that He was the Messiah. Not to believe that He was going to die for their sin or be their king. And their attitude and their actions reflected that. How they treated Him. How they talked to Him. Everything was trying to prove to everybody else that He's clearly not the guy. They not only didn't believe in Him, they didn't want anybody else to believe in Him either. So they started to test Him. John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The word flesh there is the Greek word sarx. It means flesh, body, human nature, uh, materiality, or kindred. And when it says He dwelt among us, it says that He came to hang out to hang out with us. When He dwelt among us, He stayed a while. He didn't just come and do something and leave, but He stuck around. When the Bible talks about dwelling, when we are to dwell in Christ, we are to hang out with Him and what He's about. So it tells us to dwell, to dwell in Christ, to hang out with Him often, to have our life reflect that we've been with Him long periods of time. Well, He came to hang out with us for long periods of time. He came to dwell with us. And we beheld, which means to behold, contemplate, look upon, view, I see, I visit. We beheld His glory. We were able to see Him in the flesh. Here was God represented in a man. We beheld Him. He was there. What an amazing idea. What an amazing story. There was a guy I went to Bible college with that stopped going to church. Not only did he stop going to church, but he really started to pursue human wisdom. A lot of philosophy out there on the meaning of life and why things are the way they are. He knew the biblical stance on all those things, but yet he just chose, he's like, I just don't believe it anymore. Um, I went to visit him. We went out and had dinner together. And... Uh, he just didn't believe in that anymore. It was hard to believe for him that there's a great big God out there and God sent His Son to come and live amongst us and to live amongst us for a while but then to be persecuted and to be crucified and to die and then to be raised from the dead. It's like, come on, man. Think about that for a minute. Does that make any sense? It really doesn't. I mean, when you think about like if I were God, I wouldn't do that, right? I mean, because that's kind of the base of our thinking. We think of it on human terms. We don't think of it as in a God who is perfect and holy and what He may want to do and why. Instead, we have to figure it out for ourselves. And if it doesn't match up to our own thinking, it's got to be crazy. Well, that's the same attitude that Jesus, that Jesus faced. People are like... I can't believe in this. This is nuts. The Old Testament God that we serve fought for us. He fought with us. There's portions of the Old Testament when, when Israel would go into a land, the Bible actually says that God fought with them. It says that God was credited with a lot of kills. Can you imagine? God Almighty went with your army and fought against people. So when this guy shows up on scene... And he's like, hi, I'm the, the chosen one. I'm going to be king. They're like, no, I don't think so. Because the king we're looking for is the king that we knew from the Old Testament. The God that we knew in the past, man, he laid waste to people. He drowned the Egyptians. Dropped the walls of Jericho. I mean, think of all the stories in the Bible. 
And here you are. You're claiming to be God, but man, show us something. Do something. My friend wanted to see more things. To just believe was difficult. And so, imagine those Pharisees and those Jewish leaders and this guy comes on the scene and he says, I'm the one that all of your scriptures talk about. I have fulfilled everything. I'm the fulfillment of it all. They, when they contemplated Him, when they looked upon Him, they made a decision. They didn't behold His glory. They beheld a guy that was throwing a wrench in their popularity, in their power, in their rule. Very unfortunate. He came to His own, and His own didn't receive Him. But those that did receive Him, they did behold Him. They did look upon Him as God in the flesh dwelling with us. They beheld His glory. 115, John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after Me is preferred before Me, for He was before Me. Preferred, the Greek word there, emprosthen. That's a fun one. Given precedence, or being in front of. This one that I'm talking about, man, He's in front of Me. He's not behind Me. He's not coming after. He was before I even got here. This one is preferred before me. He is the one that I'm pointing to. He's the one that you need to be thinking about. John 16, or 1, 16 and 17 says, And of His fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and, tr and truth came through Jesus Christ. When you talk about Moses to a Jewish person, you're talking about a superhero. I mean, you're talking about a guy who did amazing things. They love to talk about Moses. Moses, Elijah, there's people in the Old Testament that were used by God in such amazing ways. And now this is saying, hey, Moses gave the law, but this guy is where grace and truth come. So, grace for grace, the waves were continual pouring out of God's grace. Grace for grace comes through Christ. And again, Moses was an early pillar for the Jews, but pales in comparison to Jesus. Did you know Moses was an elderly man when he went to Egypt? He was a very old man when he went to Egypt. He didn't go as a young man. Did you know Moses was 80 years old? Think of your average 80-year-old person. If God said, you're going to go and free the slaves. I mean, you think of that today. I mean, a guy today would be like, well, can I go after my show? You know, I'd rather <laughs> sit home. I'm tired. I don't do what I used to do. I'm not as mobile as I used to be. You're talking about taking on the Egyptian army and the Pharaoh. Who am I? He couldn't speak well. His, his brother Aaron went with him. Why? Because Aaron did a lot of the talking. Moses, a speech impediment. An elderly man with a speech impediment. That's the guy I want to use to go free all of the people from Egypt. Moses, amazing. Moses talked face to face with God on a mountain. Moses brought down the Ten Commandments. Moses, 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 as the old writer used to say, right? For anybody who's seen the Ten Commandments movie. The original one. Moses was an amazing person. Did amazing things. The Red Sea. The Egyptians were coming after them. They were going to slaughter all of the Jews. What happened? Moses went up. God worked through him to part the sea. It wasn't a weird weather situation. Why? Because it says they walked on dry ground. Moses was there. He was the guy. All these things, but yet Jesus towers over all the things that Moses did. They didn't behold him. They didn't look at Jesus that way. 118 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. He has revealed Him, the bosom. Greek word, kalpon. 
means in the closest and most intimate relation to the Father. We talked about John 1, 1, which says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Those verses at the beginning of John talk about the proximity of the Son, or the Word, or the Word that became flesh. He was once in close proximity with the Father. So when He comes to reveal the Father, it's accurate. It's true. Everything is precise because He was right there in intimate relationship, in intimate proximity of the Father. He was in the bosom, meaning the chest, or right here with the Father. Close up. He has declared Him. He has made Him known. I unfold, narrate, or declare. Has Jesus been declared in your life? I hope so. We've all seen and come to know what Jesus has done. We've seen in Scripture that He came to be the Savior of the world. He came to the Jewish nation to be their king, but they rejected Him. So what did He do? He put off His kingdom. The day of the Lord is going to be in the future. We'll talk about that when we get to end times. And talking about end times events. Do you know that He's been declared in your life? Have you given Him glory for who He is? Does your life reflect that you have been with the, with the Savior because He has come to reveal the Father? And the whole point was to reconcile you and the world back to the Father, back to a relationship with Him. He has declared Him. Let's summarize. Jesus is the eternal Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. The Bible is very clear. God in the flesh. He is that eternal Word. He was always there. He was there at the beginning. The beginning as we understand it. Time. Time was created by God. He was there when He came and He dwelt among us. A light or radiance of God is offered to everyone in the world to come and partake of. Have you partaken of the Son? He's come to reveal the Father, to redeem you back. Have you taken advantage of that light that He offers? Jesus was rejected by the nation He was born in because they liked darkness rather than light. Think of your own life. Have you come to Christ or are you in darkness? Maybe you've come to Christ, but you still really like the darkness. That's the challenge. Every day of your life, you have the opportunity to walk in light or in darkness. How much does it mean to you that Christ came and took on flesh and died a horrible, cruel death on your behalf? Does it mean enough to you that you'll walk in His light? That you'll walk in light instead of darkness? He came to reveal the Father, to bring us to the Father, but also to give us a way of life, to be our example. Are you walking in light or are you walking in darkness? Does it even matter to you? Do you even care? There's a lot of stuff out there in the world. There's a lot of lights, a lot of sounds, a lot of things to partake of, a lot of fancy foods, airplanes. We just scratched the uh, rocket launch to the moon. What was that rocket name? Does anybody know? Artemis. Artemis. Where does the word Artemis come from? In Bible study. It is a god that in the town of Ephesus, the temple to Artemis was just outside of Ephesus. So when you read the book of Ephesians, and when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, you had a temple that was the size of a soccer field. That's big. It had pillars that were four feet wide. Four feet wide pillars. That's probably, probably bigger than this table. One pillar. And it had probably hundreds of pillars. Why? Because Artemis. They believed in Artemis, a.k.a. Diana. And what did they do? Is they worshipped Diana. She was the god of all, goddess of all kinds of things. They put their faith in her. And then they built a temple to her. 
they kept a lot of their money in there. It acted as a bank. And then they made trinkets. They sold, it was like the Disney world of, of Ephesus. They sold trinkets to Diana. Here, buy a keychain. Here, buy a shirt. You know, whatever. Buy shoes. Buy a hat. Whatever. They sold all these things to Artemis. Isn't that amazing? We just now have a rocket being made to go to the moon in the name of Artemis. A false god. It's amazing. You want to read about that, go to Acts 16 and the book of Ephesians. You'll read about uh, 16 and 17. You'll read about when Paul got there and started talking about Christ. They didn't like that because they made money off of Artemis. I don't have time for Christ. I'm too busy. i got too much of my life um, to worry about. I'm trying to make money. I'm trying to get ahead. I'm trying to make more, more money than the other guy. I want a bigger boat than the other guy. What is it that makes you walk in darkness? You have your own plans. I have what I want to do in life. What is it? What is it that's better than Christ? Because we show that every day how we act, how we live, what we choose to believe in. What are you putting ahead of Christ in your life? He was rejected by his own people because people like darkness rather than light. If you want to pursue Christ in life, realize you're going to be in a small crowd. Do you want to be in a big crowd? Do you want the world notoriety and everything else, it's going to take walking in darkness to do that. Because if you want to walk in Christ, the Bible talks about much of the world does not like Christ. They crucified Him. The world is not real friendly when it comes to Christ. And Jesus Himself told us, they didn't like me, they're not going to like you either. When you stand up for Christ, it's standing up for a lonely life. Notice we don't have... 10,000 people here in this room. we got a small crowd. I've invited a bunch of people here. What's the problem? I've invited non-church people. Why don't they come? Men love darkness rather than light. Too busy. I do other things on Sunday that take priority. What takes priority in, learn in your life? Does learning the Word take priority? Or does it not? Being around other believers, does it take a priority? Or does it not? These are all the things that Knowing Christ. Amazing, right? It's so easy to get sidetracked because surely pursuing greatness in this life is a good thing. I got nothing wrong with that. Just define greatness. Jesus, who has come to reveal the Father, He is the true representation on earth of who God is. Jesus very plainly says, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He came to be representative of who father is again do we look at him that way has Jesus changed our life has Jesus changed who we are as people because we've seen him and now we know the father because we've seen him Jesus came he explained the father he demonstrated the father through his character and actions he came he healed people and talked about an eventual healing where we won't ever be sick ever again he talked about all these things, and that's the desire of the Father. He revealed all those things. He showed us the desire of the Father. He showed us the love of the Father and the judgment of the Father. I always say there is a time to turn over tables. One of my favorite portions of Scripture. Jesus goes into the temple. They're selling stuff. It was a big courtyard area. It was rather large, probably this big or bigger. Jesus walks into the temple area looks around and there's all these people exchanging money and making deals. What does he do? Flips the tables. You made this about money. It's not about money. Jesus has come. He, he was here. He came to reveal the Father. Why? So that you and I can make good decisions from this point on. We can now know what the Father wants. We can now know what He expects. We now know how to get right with Him. He's revealed the Father to us. There's no mystery anymore. What does God want me to do? Read your Bible. You'll find out everything. 
Who does he want me to be? Read your Bible. You'll find out. I have moments in my life. I want God to tell me where to go. Read your Bible. He'll tell you where to go. He answers all those questions. Understand that Christ came to reveal the Father so that we can please the Father. Are you pleasing to the Father in your life? That's the question. Do you do the things, do you say the things that are pleasing to the Father? Are you consistent with the life of Christ? That is our challenge. Let's close the prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that it is very clear when it talks about that the eternal word took on flesh. We thank you that you came to us to be a clear representation that we can behold with our very eyes, God in the flesh. We thank you so much that when you were here, you revealed the Father. Clearly, you talked about the will of the Father and how to be in it. Lord, it is a challenge to us to not only behold the Savior, but Lord, the challenge is, is once we've beheld the Savior, how have we changed? Does the world know that we have spent time with Christ? Does the world see it? Is there something different about us because we are in the will of God, because we are in the will of the Father, because through the Savior we have come to know what that is? Lord, I pray that you would help us all to remember daily that we need to wake up and we need to walk in Christ because that is your desire for us. Lord, we know that the work that we do for you is not in vain. We have rewards that are coming to us when we do the right thing. When we walk in you and the whole plan and process gets worked out perfectly where we are an example for you because the Son revealed, revealed you to us. Lord, we're just grateful that you have given us your word that explains all this. Help us to be wise in how we live. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.